Welcome one, welcome all. Welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network, www.talesoftyria.com. I am Bridger, and we are, well, we're live. We're also almost live from the Rosewind Tavern in Lion's Arch. Uh, there are two different groups of people, three different groups of people watching this. You could be, A, watching the show live, on the Justin TV stream that we have up. And we're gonna try to do this every Sunday night at about eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight Time, I guess is what it is right now, minus five GMT. Um, you could be watching the video portion of this uh, on Justin TV after we have recorded it, or you could be listening to the audio. I think most people are gonna be listening to the audio, so we're gonna try and do that. But just so you know, in the future, on Sunday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, we are going to be on there so you can watch the show being recorded live and put your own feedback in the chat channel there on Justin TV and we can sort of have fun, um, you know, responding to people. So if, so if we say something stupid, we can correct ourselves immediately instead of having to have three dozen people email us and tell us how stupid we are. <laughs> so that is hopefully the goal. So I am Bridger. Again, uh, welcome to the show. And let me introduce everybody else we have on here. Uh, Freelancer. Nope, that's that's great. Sorry, great's the one on the screen. <laughs> Hello, great. Uh, hey. <laughs> and Freelancer interrupts. So for those, yeah, but for those, those people watching, they can actually see I'm not a robot. So. Uh, yeah, well, you're an android. Cylon, you know. Could be any of those things. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Now I question um, Andrew, though, you know, with that whole logo thing. It's kind of scary. But, um, yeah, I'm Freelancer, by the way. Um and if you guys got any questions and stuff, holler them out on chat. Indeed. So uh, we've also got joining us Aku, and hey. uh, he should be popping up here if he says something. Hello. Hey, guys. It's good to be back. There he is. I should be there? Yes, you Loader. are. Awesome. So we're still experimenting <laughs> with this, by the way. All right, we're going to try and move on here for the audio listeners that are just like, get on with the show. This is <laughs> not Guild Wars. This is Justin TV time. All right. Uh, also on the show, we have Gigawatt. Welcome back. Hey, good to be here. All right. So let's get right into it, shall we? There's not a whole lot of news today. We're trying to keep this week, rather. We're trying to keep the show short. And so what we're actually going to do is jump right into PvP. PvP. And then after that, we're going to discuss a little PvP. That's right. This is the PvP show, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a lot to talk about. So PvP in Guild Wars 2. Let's give a quick overview, and then we'll dive right into it. Comes in uh, basically two distinct forms. One is a giant version of Alterac Valley that is essentially, instead of having two factions in the game that fighting each other on the same server, everybody on your server in the normal world, when you're just questing in PvP, PvE, we're all on the same team. You can't kill anybody else. There's no PvP there. However you can go into a special place called World vs. World vs. World, and in that mode, our entire server, the server that you're on, plays against two other servers in a massive battle with objectives to capture and castles to siege and all kinds of crazy stuff. No player limit on any side, and as a result, it can be really imbalanced, it can be all kinds of crazy stuff, and it's more like Dark Age of Camelot or Warhammer Online, or Warhammer, uh, that kind of large-scale epic combat. That's one version of the PvP that's going to be in Guild Wars 2. The other version of the PvP that's going to be in Guild Wars 2 is known as competitive PvP. It's going to be more like a first-person shooter style game mode. If you think about TF2, if you think about, you know, a, a, well, TF2, uh, then you've got the idea. The, the, the map that we've been shown and the game mode that we've been shown is a sort of conquest game mode, just like a battlefield style where there's points on the map that allow you to uh, capture them. And if you hold them, the opponent's tickets drain or points or whatever it is. And the first team, and it actually, sorry, it's backwards. It's more like Alteric, or sorry, Arathi Basin in, in World of Warcraft, where the, the score slowly goes up if you hold on to the points. So that's the main game mode in the competitive PvP, at least that's the one that's been revealed, and that can go anywhere from 5 versus 5 to 10 versus 10, and that is the completely balanced game mode. So there's a lot of great things to talk about within this. Um, where do you guys want to start? Uh, let's, let's talk about that actual specific scenario. I actually, uh, don't mind hearing about that all over again, because um, I don't think a lot of people actually know what's involved in that. So if we start there, that'd be great. The world versus world versus world, or the... Yes, yes, okay. what we know about that. So, 
the the big shadowy realm of world versus world. <laughs> exactly. So we don't know a terrible lot of, about it. Uh, they have revealed a number of different things. There will be large-scale objectives that require a lot of people, and it will be sort of the same dynamic event system that they use in PvE. You're going to be walking along, and then suddenly a dynamic event will appear on your map when you get close enough to it, and it'll say, hey, that castle needs capturing. Go take it. And, of course, that's going to be one of, if it's a large castle, one main objective, it's probably going to take a lot of people to do, which is why they, make, they call these things epic. However, there's going to be a lot of smaller things to do as well on the side. Maybe go and, uh, and, and mine some stuff or get some timber or what have you. And then when you do that, you've got a mission to escort the cart, you know, TF2 style. And the other team is going to get a dynamic event that says, hey, those guys are escorting the cart. Go stop them. And, of course, like any of the other dynamic events in Guild Wars 2, there's going to be consequences. If your cart may, manages to make it back to the base, you'll get some kind of siege weaponry that now assaults the castle. And if they prevent you from getting that mine cart back to the base, then maybe they can steal it, or maybe they can go get the mine and get to bring the, the stuff back to their base instead. So, I mean, I'm kind of excited. That sounds like a really cool concept. Yeah, it gives players... Um... It's almost like a PVE thing too, you know. If if you just want to be that solo guy that goes out and um, uh, let's say doesn't really want to do the big castle sieges or, or anything fancy like that, you could actually go and uh, just do the little side quests. You know, maybe you want to do the public quest that spawns when the minecart is taken back to an enemy base. You know, let's say a new minecart or a new um, uh, convoy, we'll call it. Uh, spawns and uh, their you know public quest pops up on your screen. You, you don't have a big group of friends, or maybe they're just not online. You can go do that. You know, it gives everybody from the the little guy something to do, and actually, you know, their credit to team. You know, when they do it, yeah. Uh, versus the big old you know guild raids, they can go you know raids you know castles and stuff, and it gives everybody a sense of accomplishment. I love it. There's definitely uh, the way from what we know about it is it feels a lot like it's the Warhammer RVR zones. Mm -hmm. So it feels like that. Like, But we don't know all the details about it yet. So uh, there's like these weird objectives and stuff that go on in there. And they've given examples like that cart one. And yeah. I mean, the, world, the, the RVR and Warhammer Online was so... That was like the part of the game that I loved, mm -hmm. uh, that whole thing. That RVR. Um, who here has played RVR? Who, who's... I have. Uh, I have as well. Like really bit, yeah. gotten into it. Uh, yeah. Everybody here. Yeah, I got to like the second tier and played a bit in there, but there wasn't anybody on my server when I was trying to play. Well, all right. But before the cataclysm that was server merges, um, RVR was was awesome, especially if you got a, like a bunch of good groups together and stuff. Um, it, it for people, especially you know, looking around the community here and stuff. Uh, I'm reading through like Guru and PvP and etc. Team Legacy. Uh, a lot of people have never experienced RVR, so when they hear World vs. World, I don't think they realize just how cool that is. It, it, you, know, especially, you really have got to play, and I'm not saying go out and play Warhammer because it's not what it was, but you have really got to look into, let's say, RVR videos, for example, um, in order to experience what it is. And, and unless you've ever experienced it, Keep an open mind because it is going to blow your mind. I mean, structured PvP is one thing, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about that. But um, World versus World is going to be such a big thing if they do it right. That's the key thing there, if they exactly. do it right. Um, that it's, uh, it, it's it, you know, it's huge. And, and nobody that has never – and I should – let me rephrase that. Anybody that has not played RVR will never understand that. Just that simple, you know. Yeah, that's definitely correct. I know. think if uh, if they've never done RVR, I guess a, a good a good indicator would be the um, the uh, Altered Valley and World of Warcraft before the um, before the change when literally Altered Valley matches would take days. You would log on, you'd fight, feel the strife, log out, and then log back in the next day, and the fight is still going on. I really have that. I think that the World v World is really going to have that that sense of just epic battle where you know one team is pushing one uh one team and then maybe a couple hours you log off log back on and then that team's just pushing back forth you know it's gonna be it's gonna be epic and i can't wait for it 
I could one up you on that one there, uh, Devin. Uh, tar and Mel. Who who does not remember oh, Tar and Mel? Oh, uh, the, oh man, Tar and Mel. <laughs> you know the South Shore versus Tar and Mel or Tar and Mel. Uh, you know battle is uh, that is is world PvP. I don't. I would give anything to go back to those days. You know what's, you know what's going to be crazy? It, we're it, sixty years from now or something, right? Like like fifty, sixty years from now, we are going to be walking down the street. And we're going to see another old person. We're going to see, do you remember Terran Mill? Yes! <laughs> I was there, man! I was what? there! That's going to be, like, the cred. That's that's ridiculous. That or the Barons, like, on your shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll be, uh, yeah, there you go. Really? That's bragging rights right there. It really is. So the other thing that we didn't mention about it, though, is that in World vs. World, each... Basically, over a period of two weeks, you're going to be playing against two other servers. And the concept is there's going to be four zones. Each server has its home zone and then a middle zone that they're all contesting. So if one server is doing particularly well and holding a lot of the objectives in the middle zone, they are going to get the option to, I, I assume, like invade the other zones. So I guess holding the objectives over time is probably the main goal of the world versus world. So even if you just go on there and take some objectives and hold them for a while and you log off and when you come back, they've all been taken back, you did your part for that period of time. Like that's one of the things that I hated in like Planetside. Anybody ever plays Planetside? Have not. I've heard a lot of good things about it, though. There, I mean, there's nope. a lot of great things about it. It was it was always crazy and epic, but the game didn't really end or didn't really have a victory for any of the given sides, at least at the beginning. I don't know if they ever changed it, but there was no victory unless one of the three factions, like, locked down and took over a huge chunk of the continent. So you could – or not continent, the continents – so you could come in with your team and you could take over all, basically a whole continent by yourself with your whole team you know, flying around, taking over stuff. And then you log out and you log back in later and the continent's been taken back over by a different team. And now you got to do it all over again. And there was no real persistence. It felt no real accomplishment because you didn't get scored for that victory, for that time that you had it. It only matters if you take it over and hold everything simultaneously, basically. So... What's interesting here is that every two weeks, you're going to get rematched up against two new servers. Basically, after two weeks, they re-rank everybody based on the performance that that server had in that World vs. World PvP for that two-week period. And then you're ranked up against two other servers that are equal to you in rank or close to, close to you in rank. So that theoretically means that you could have servers that have high world versus world populations with low organization versus servers that have low populations um, and high organization. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, one really important thing to kind of uh, promote world versus world I think is really awesome is that uh, you can go in there at level one. You know, um, you don't have to do the PVE. I I mean, God forbid, but you don't have to do any of the quests or the <laughs> the the awesome cinematics or, or anything like that. I mean, you can actually go in there at day one and say, and you know it. what, I will do nothing but knock on the doors of guild keeps, and that's fine. Um, you will be given the equipment. I mean, they've they've confirmed that you can like as a ranger, you can get unique pets in there. Um, and not only that, but everything you do in there is actually helping your server at the same time. So if you hold all of these different keeps and such, uh, you know, we had a guy in our, our chat here. Awesome, by the way, Spoo, oh. for bringing that up. Yeah, uh, Bridger, not staying on top of that. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he mentioned um, the fact that, you know, when you take the objectives, et cetera, and you take the keeps, that it actually helps your server out. Now, in Warhammer, if you guys remember that, um, that it was similar, you know. If you held all the points in a, in a zone, you would get a bonus bonus experience and other minor things. Um, but in they're trying to make it in Guild Wars Two, where like holding your server winning, or, or whether it's you've already won or you're winning, or you're holding certain points or certain lumber mills and stuff, that it's actually going to affect the economy, the structure, maybe the quest, the public quest available of what's going on in your server. So you may not be doing PvE, you may have a lot of friends doing PvE, but because of your success or failure uh, in World vs. World, you're actually affecting their gameplay for the bet, you know, for better or less. So um, I think that's great. I mean, that's so dynamic. It actually makes you feel like you're you're doing something. You know, that you're not just 
you know, you're just some everyday mule, you know, that means nothing. You know, you're actually making an impact for your server, which is really cool. One of the biggest things that about this like whole world versus world versus world thing is the community building that's gonna it's gonna promote. Like the whole idea that your whole your individual server is gonna have to compete against other servers. So there's gonna be a lot more like cohesion on all these servers community wise that they're gonna like have to work together every week or whatever the reset is for these like world versus world worlds. And you see in like most games right now they have the faction split where there's two sides on one server. So it's those two sides and that one server fighting one another. Instead it's gonna be like your whole server is gonna be together. Like there's no like the char aren't their own faction or anything. Everyone works together in PvE and everyone's gonna work together in PvP. So the other thing that I think is really cool is they've mentioned that guilds will be able to take keeps and sort of fly their banners uh, you know on the battlements of the keep and they'll be able to basically quick go you know quick quick move quick what do they call it uh, teleport to the keep when it's in trouble and things like that because it's their keep the guild captured it sort of a thing so there's going to be incentives for guilds to work as a large team you know 10 15 20 people in the world versus world versus world, and those are going to be the larger organizations that are going to take on the things like the larger castles and keeps. Whereas if you're just going in single, hey, nobody in my guild is on right now, or I'm not in a very big guild, let me just you know team up with this one guy over here, or let me get my friend over here, and let's just go after the minecart objective. Let's just go after you know capturing the barracks so that maybe we have more NPC guards that spawn on our keep or something like that. <clears throat> Speaking of NPCs, also. Um they've mentioned that they're actually using NPCs. I mean, there's never going to be a perfect balance in, in world versus world. And this is where like the controversy kind of jumps in and uh, a big gray area, but, um, NPCs, they have mentioned on occasion in different interviews that they will be greater or lesser in size, depending on the opponent's player count. So for example, oh. if, um, if I'm coming up to a keep and, and my server just has a lot more active, you know, world versus world players, I'm going to find that that keep is far more defended, uh, possibly than, let's say I'm, you know, I'm coming with uh, a lot less players, for example. You know, it, they're trying to use NPCs to uh, balance out things, uh, and, and we'll see how that works. I think it's still, I mean, world versus world is world is, is what it is. Uh, it's I as much as they're trying. I still think it's going to be a Zerg fest, and this is me being pessimistic, and I really hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm dead wrong, but I still think it's going to be a, like, who has the bigger army type type ordeal. It might be. Um, yeah, it's, we'll see. I mean, the only way that they're really going to stop that is if uh, they put a huge emphasis on, you know, capturing these siege points and um, actually doing these quests to, you know, promote more or less the buffs that the army or your server will be getting. So, um... I guess the only way that they can stop the Zerg mentality, which unfortunately might happen, or uh, you know, is just by making sure that they have these these incentives to actually do the quest and actually keep these uh, these siege you know the siege uh, siege castles and things like that. Well, the 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 main problem is <clears throat> in those kinds of situations where you have a lot of objectives, and it's much more uh, you can get things done on a, a much higher success rate if you have. 50 people going around and doing each of them one at a time and just crushing everything as you go, then if you split that 50 people up into five groups of 10 and they each tackle a different objective and maybe don't succeed. So that's really what you have to do. So the problem is if you put a lot of NPC guards in there, that only encourages people to group up because it makes it harder for smaller groups to succeed. What I'd love to see is dynamically spawning NPC numbers based upon the number of player, of opponent players in that area specifically. So there's only a group of five, for example, only a group of five, uh, you know, players coming up to this, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's not a keep, maybe it's a small outpost, then it only spawns a few guards. But if there's a group of 20 players, then it spawns more guards, same the way that the dynamic events in PvE will scale up based on the number of players. That's what I'd love to see, region-based, rather than just, oh, there's 300 people playing PvE World vs. World right now, therefore, all of the places will spawn more guards. Yeah, and it's important to note that I, I do think, as negative as I am about it, it, it's just because I really want them to succeed in it. Um, I put all of my my heart into Warhammer. I, I was there in the alpha beta, um, you know, and I was I was the guy on every forum spamming, you know, you guys really got to try this out, you know, and they it ended up broken. And Guild Wars has taken a much different approach, so. 
uh, one of the key things I think is just kind of throw it in there um, as we wrap this up is that sidekicking is only that sidekicking. Um, I had a guy in the chat bring it up. Awesome, by the way. Um, it, it will bump you up to a level, but it will never make you exactly matched to a certain level. Um, I don't know if we yeah, really got it. Correct. I, the yeah, way go ahead. that I understand it is that in World versus World versus World, the skills that you have unlocked based on your level, like your regular progression, when you get bumped up to 80, your stats go up, but you don't get any new skills. You don't get any new trait points or whatever the, the system that they're using. So a level 1 bumped up to level 80 will be able to do, you know, statistically a lot more damage than when he was level 1, but he won't have any new things to do. He won't have any new utility skills unlocked. So a level 20 who's bumped up to level 80 is going to be more effective than a level 1 bumped up to level 80. But you can level up while you're in World vs. World, and, it's, and it's presumably you're going to be able to do some damage. I mean, obviously you're not going to have everything that you can do all the time, but it's better than just, you know, not being able to participate until you get all the way to level to 80, for sure. Yeah, so I let me ask you, Luke. Um, uh, you played RVR a lot, too. You too, Devin, right? Yep. Okay, so what if we had two... 25 man groups come up against each other. We're talking open field, no no keep in sight, and they're going against each other. What made one group better than the other in, in Warhammer, for example? I can guess, but I'll let them answer. Yeah. Well, what do you think, Devin? Well, usually, at least from my perspective, you always had those, uh, you always had people who didn't want to heal or didn't want to do the world that they wanted or that they picked. And because of that, everybody wanted to do DPS and try to kill things. And the other team, um, you know, they said, all right, well, you know, you're a healer, you're a tank, you know, you've got the stabby, stabby rogue in the back. We all know, they all know their, ro they, they all know their roles. And because of that, they won just by that fact. Um, whereas they were just a lot more uh, strategic. They had a lot more um, just strategy. And at, at least from my standpoint, when I did RVR, that was the bane of my existence. <laughs> but you, you, the very first thing you said was healers. Healers made the group, right? Yes. Uh, Tar and Mill, Luke. I mean, what made the group between the Horde and, and, the, and the South Shore guys, you know, is the healers. Now, what does Guild Wars 2 not have? No healers. De dedicated yeah. healers. That's a good point. That's right. Yep. Okay, and that's that's another thing that kind of has me on edge, and, and we'll see. But if you don't have dedicated healers, what are you left with? You're left with a bunch of people that can heal themselves for moderately decent amount when they're not under attack and when they're not uh, doing all the deeps. But um, that leaves you with just ranged DPS because if you're a tank, guess what? You can't rush the enemy line because you don't have healers backing you up. You know, So uh, that's out of the question. Um, so that leaves you with uh, a mass of ranged guys on both sides. You got the guys on the left side; they don't have any dedicated healers. The guys on the right side, no dedicated healers, and they just harass each other with ranged stuff. Well, um, actually, you know what I think we're gonna see, and I don't know if this is gonna be solved by any other. But if you have the kind of tools like you had in World of Warcraft, where you could target things, so the whole raid could see, you're just gonna have people, you know, shoot him, and then 25 arrows, fireballs, everything hits that one guy. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, you shoot that guy. And then 25 more, shoot that guy, and just one hit kills all the you, time. You give far too much credit to the average player. Oh, no, I'm talking about when you have a guild of players. <laughs> okay, okay, well... The arrows are collidable, too, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can, are. like, dodge shit. Well, yeah, you can dodge. That's right. That's right. If, if that happens, you can dodge. And when you dodge, you will evade pretty much all damage during the period when you are dodging. Exactly. Uh, I'm just worried that it's... Guardian shield. Yeah, what Andrew said. And, and I'm also worried a little bit, just, you know, without the dedicated healers, that that's what it is. It's just everybody's going to be, that is interested in world versus world, is either going to roll a ranger elementalist. And I don't want to hear that nonsense that, oh, I could play a warrior ranged character. You're going to either be a ranger, an elementalist, a necromancer, no, mesmer. No, no, I think it's going to happen. I have faith. <laughs> I have faith. Uh, I, I, think, I, think, I'm I think it's going to I'm going to make be... a ranged warrior. No. I, I play a warrior, master archer. No. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's it's warrior. Why not? It's going to be <laughs> you can do it. Why target one person when you can hit everyone? It's great. <laughs> <laughs> like a warrior without the pet. I mean, a ranger without the pet. But a lot more armor. And a, and a lot more uh, hit points. 
All right, so that's uh, let's see. We spent a good amount of time on the world versus world, so let's talk a little bit about the competitive mode of PvP. Now, unlike the world versus world, when you jump into the competitive mode of PvP, you are leveled up. You're given all of the skills. I presume you're given all of the trait points, and you're given a selection of gear that's the same as everybody else of your class that is given. You're not going to earn any special PvP gear that makes you better than anybody else. It's perfectly even. It's like picking your picking a custom class for TF2. It's like, oh, well, I want this gear because I'm spec for this, and I'm going to have this loadout of skills because that's the kind of role that I want to play with my ranger this time. I don't want to be, you know, range support. I want to be solo, you know, fighter, ra you know, ranging around kind of a thing. So you're going to be able to trick out your class in the kind of way that you want to and everybody's going to have exactly the same options and nobody's going to have any artificial advantages which is fantastic that to me is the best news ever and I know they did that in Guild Wars 1 I'm just so happy it's continuing it really feels um, that by doing that it feels like like old school like gladiator arena you go, you go in there you put two people in all they have are the raiments that the you know the gladiators are, are allowed to use. A couple of weapons, a helmet maybe, and you guys just fight to the death. <laughs> and um, I, I really feel by doing that, it really takes out the whole. Oh, I have this awesome trinket that allows me to one shot clothies or one shot whoever. And um, because I have that, my team is going to win. Um, by do, by taking that out of the out of the picture, take uh, you know it brings um, team composition. Uh, strategy and all of that into the forefront and it'll literally separate the good players from the bad players. I feel it removes the uh, the time investment in gear that people put in, and especially in arenas and WoW. It removes that totally from the game. And it also removes it, I know there was this in Guild Wars, if I read correctly, that there was a time investment they put into skills, like getting the skills they want. So it also removes that. So it's not how much time you're putting into like these small little things like getting your gear and getting your skills. It's going to be more how much time do you put in actually practicing? How much time do you put into actually developing your build? Yeah. Uh, figuring things out. You know, Solving these issues that you might show up whenever you're playing. And I'm so happy about that. I, it, I can't even explain how happy it makes me to, to understand how the way that works. So, <clears throat> as we mentioned, so that's the big difference. In world versus world versus world, when you're leveled up to 80, you're not given all of the skills. You're not given all of the spells. Your gear is leveled up to a level 80 equivalent. So there is some gear, but it's more of a casual mode. It's a mode for epic, unbalanced carnage. And competitive PvP is for competitive modes. So, basically... Within competitive PvP, there's basically two separate systems. You could do a hot joinable sort of a pickup game that is just a bunch of pubs, a bunch of people that you don't know in a, in a server as if it was like a TF2 server. And they have mentioned that these servers can be run by communities, can be run by players, can be run by, you know, Guild Wars 2 Guru, the six servers that they have, or Team Liquid, their guild servers that people can go and join on. And they, you know, you can, I assume, as uh, an admin of the server, you can probably kick out people that are becoming a problem. They, that basically sounds like what they're trying to do. And that's sort of the hot joinable. You can join and leave whenever you feel like it, whatever. The other mode is the competitive mode, which is when you make a pre-made team of five players. And it's only five players, not eight players like in Guild, War, um, uh, Guild Wars 1. And we'll talk about that in a second. So you got five players against five other players. And when you say, I've got my five players with, I've got my four players with me, click go. It's basically going to put you in a queue when seven other teams... Anywhere on any server in your region, like North America, when seven other teams have hit that button and are now in the queue, you are put into a single elimination bracket, and you play three rounds, and whoever wins the tournament wins the tournament. And that team would then get qualifier points. I assume it would be a guild. Would get qualifier points. And when you go uh, to participate in the monthly tournaments... Those are special tournaments that are only thrown once a month. They cost a certain number of qualifier points to get into. So you have to win a certain number of these sort of pickup tournament games in order to get into the monthly tournament. If you win a monthly tournament, and obviously there will be 12 teams that win the monthly tournament, then you get to go to the annual tournament, which probably has a, you know, you get flown to a, a location where there's a LAN tournament set up and you have a cash prize, that kind of a thing. So what do you guys think about the 5 versus 5 being the only major competitive mode? It's got a lot of people up in arms, that's for sure. But that's you're you're mentioning 
uh, public tournaments. You know, you're not mentioning uh, private tournaments, That's which true. is another factor. Uh, like for example, terrible. you know, not to not to plug my own site, but you know, we'll be hosting private tournaments. Just a lot of people will be hosting private tournaments. Ours will be six versus six, back to the classic guild versus guild. Um, whereas other sites will be hosting maybe three versus threes and stuff. So that's not the only way to play structure. But as far as in a public venue, um, I think what. I mean, we can get into a whole tangent on esports and you know what that means, but a lot of it's going to be based on how fair they they make it as far as the tournaments. I mean, you mentioned one tournament a month, maybe it could be a couple tournaments a month. They they could do ten monthly qualifier tournaments a month, um, and and they very well might. You're right. Um, it's it's depending really on on the rewards. Like, what do we know? I mean, Bridger, what do you know about the rewards of these tournaments, if anything? I mean, do you get a title? Do you get... You yeah, know? I think you can get cosmetic rewards and titles as far as, uh, you know, if you win a tournament or if you... you, you then I think you, I think you can get... So, obviously, I mentioned you get qualifier points, and I don't know how many it'll take. Maybe you have to win five tournaments a month before you can even join a monthly tournament, for all I know. I don't know how big they're planning it. It's probably going to take some scaling based on the number of people participating. But you probably also get titles and uh, and and... You can get cosmetic armor, armor that looks really cool, but is statistically no better or worse than the other armor that's available in PvP. So there's probably some cool-looking armor that you can unlock if you reach a certain rank as a team of, you know, as a guild or something like that within the competitive PvP pickup tournament mode. Or maybe if you make your way to the third round of a monthly tournament, then you get access to this cool armor. That would be my guess as to uh, one way that they'd do it. So in regards to... Uh... The public's, we'll, we'll call it the public and the private scene, just for lack of a better term right now. Uh, we'll say the, the, the ones that are run by ArenaNet, okay, uh, the public scene. Do they, have they even made the slightest mention? Have any of you guys heard anything about, um, you know, whether there's cash prizes involved um, or whether they're sponsoring that? Because when you talk esports and you talk pro level players, people that, uh, have a fan base, people that are streamed and casted, and, and you know people cheer and, and create forum fan bases around these people. You're talking money. You're not talking titles. You're not talking, um, you know, a, a cool little cape and stuff like that. They don't care about that, and the fans mm -hmm. don't care about that. And, and it's something to consider. I, I think if Arena Net, um, I have a, a huge passion, as you can tell, for the the development of the esports, uh, regard or the side of the things on that, but. Um, Unless they really consider the fact that it, it has to be a lot more than just um, than a cape, then we run into a problem, and that's a problem that um, will have to be either filled by the private sector or people won't take the game seriously. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm almost positive that Guild Wars 1 had major cash prize. Like, I know they had a major mm -hmm. annual tournament every year. I mean, I think it took place in Korea a couple of yep. times where they flew out mm -hmm. the top guilds of, of, of the game that had won the most in-game, you know, guild versus guild matches or tournaments or however that was set up, and they had a major cash land every year. So I'm guessing they're going to have at least that. As far as the monthly tournaments, I'm not sure. Well, I'm sure the monthly tournaments will not. I mean, that's just not fiscally right. feasible. Um, but the fact that they have done a structured PvP focus on their website, okay, they did the whole little, you know, showing you the structure of it, how it works. And they mention, you know, in different interviews, capes and titles and, and what we just said. But one thing they never mention, they've never touched on whatsoever, is cash prizes. Um, you know, we know that Guild Wars 1 had it. But you also have um, a slightly different organization that's doing Guild Wars 2. Um, you have a different focus in Guild Wars 2 where they've come out and said that we're doing this and this. But one thing that none of us have heard is how well they're going to support the actual esports as far as money is concerned. Um, the fact they've left that out is what I'm getting at. You know, How long um, after Guild Wars 1? Hey, there's did... Jay Vega joining us, I should mention. Well, Hello. Hello. Sorry. Sorry for my tardiness. It's okay. I Better forget. late um... than never. <laughs> <laughs> um... But how how long after I, I I'm not familiar. But how long after Guild Wars One did they actually start having these cash tournaments? This is this is the kind of situation where I would love to have like thirty people or more in the chat room that could all shout out the answer because <laughs> yeah. I don't. Well, know. You, we don't. You I guys. mean, the the whole the whole point I'm getting at is that you, they may not mention it right now, 
but maybe they're just not mentioning it because they don't have enough details and they don't want to I say agree. something and cause all this speculation. I think it's But I mean, I think, I think we're all on the same page that they're trying to make this an eSports game. It's Definitely. just, it's just that the, the means and the details are still a little bit hazy for them. I think right now they're focusing on you know, getting the game out, making it balanced, and then after that, after the game starts picking up, then they'll have a whole sector of just focusing on the eSports. Certainly. I mean, I think, I think that's more probable than anything else, really. I mean, if you, were, if you had a certain amount of limited resources and you're trying to make a game and you don't have to worry about the specific, you know, the kinds of things like you're talking about, like ca- cash rewards and, and, and those kinds of details, those don't have to be coded into the game, obviously. Those kinds of details can be worked out later. You know, the game's not even coming out for another six months or whatever. So hey, as a that. result, <laughs> oh, okay, four months, let's say. Let's no. go across the fingers, right? <laughs> three months, all right, three months. But... That's it, Bridger. You just got 20 emails flaming you. I'm no, just saying. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean, oh, six months? Good. What do you mean? <laughs> Burn them at the stake. But you see what I'm saying. You have a lot of resources now that you need to spend finishing this game. And you don't really need to use those resources to try and deal with all of that or, or even um, announce that. Like, you don't necessarily... I mean, that's the kind of thing that they could probably talk about later. Right now, they're trying to get all of the mechanics straight, make sure there's no bugs, and make sure everything is presented well. But yeah. that is something I'd want to announce if they had it. So, it could, you know what? I don't even know. I, mean, I just convinced I, oh, myself just, of the other direction now. I, just, I feel just, like... Oh, go on, Vega. Oh, no, no, you, you go ahead, you go ahead. Well, I feel like the reason like though they locked into this 5v5 format is because they want to appeal now. They want to start appealing to like esports, like maybe MLG and like IEM and all those crazy es- big esports like tournaments. So they had to lock into, like, this is going to be our format. This is what it's going to be. And they showed it at PAX Prime this year. They showed this is how it's going to basically be, you know. Of course, there's going to be all kinds of tweaks and stuff that we're going to do, but... You know, they're, they're sort of almost trying to sell their game to the esports community, I feel, by locking in that 5v5 and saying this is how it is. I, I think the fact that esports is it's really booming right now. And companies now, they're making games that can be an esport. And they realize that, you know, with the success of StarCraft 2 and the Dota and all the other games that have these big tournaments, when they realize wow, this is really picking up, they, it's dumb of them to not want to try and get in on that. I would think so, too. The other thing to think about is that that 5 versus 5 number is the standard for basically every other eSport game. It's either 5 versus 5 or 6 versus 6, and the, the simple reason for that is if you're flying a team to a land to participate in a cash tournament, you don't want to fly 9 people. That's really expensive for a tournament that's only going to pay out, you know, maybe $50,000 to the winner. You know, the sponsors like Intel or NVIDIA that sponsor these teams, they don't want to pay to fly nine people to a tournament. They'd rather pay to fly five or six people to a tournament. So that's, that's how the teams, like, because when I was playing, you know, Team Fortress 2, or Team Fortress, I'm sorry, the original Team Fortress back in the day, it was eight versus eight or nine versus nine. And I have seen progressively over time that number in the competitive FPS community, as an example, slowly go down until it rested at about 5 versus 5 for all of the major competitive modes in almost all of the major games. Even in the Battlefield games, in the Call of Duty games, I'm pretty sure it's like 6 versus 6, and those games are meant to be massive. One thing I... to follow the lower number of people. It is. As a spectator. One thing I hope they don't do is, like, they have it in Halo and they have it in Black Ops. It's the coach... I hate that. The guy that's sick. <laughs> it's basically like, let's not, co- let's not communicate as a team. Let's have somebody else communicate for us. I just hate that. And I know I'm probably going to get a lot of flack from like Halo people. And they're like, ah, oh, you don't know shit. I'm like, well, I mean, I don't like it. I mean, if the people can't communicate with each other, then you don't deserve to play I, well. I, I got to tell you, though, one of the coolest things ever was when I was broadcasting with TSN and, and GameFire doing the, you know, traveling around broadcasting those tournaments. It was really awesome to see a Counter Strike team sitting down at a table, and they're all wearing like jerseys that say like Intel or something, you know, whatever. And it's like, uh, you know, the Complexity or some one of the other big Counter Strike teams. And behind them is a guy wearing a suit 
that's going, come on, you guys, they're going to B. Get them at B. You can do it. And they're all talking on their heads, but he's, like, behind them giving them the, the, the hey, you can do it, man. Hey, good job, Bray. Yeah, you got them. Awesome. He's got, he's awesome got the off. whiteboard, and he's like, all right, you're going to go here. Exactly. That was really guy. cool. It gave it legitimacy. <laughs> First base coach in Counter-Strike. <laughs> <laughs> so we got, we got one of our, uh, our, our guys chiming in here in chat saying that Colin has specifically said that they're, they're going to try to – uh, host some cash tournaments, so that's great. If if they follow through with that, uh, that is awesome. Um, you know, we hit on we hit on esports and what's going to make it good. I'm kind of speaking for the community for a split second. Um, looking through some of the Guru threads and uh, a couple other sites here. Uh, what do you guys think is required as of right now? If they launch the game, we'll say four months here. <laughs> uh, if they launch the game in four months. And they just wanted to kickstart this esports scene. What do you think makes a, a a game credible for esports and not just a mockery? I would say just to start off that one, you need a built-in spectator mode. Um, they're lacking yep. that. You know, following behind Izzy as he's owning everybody with his elementalist, that's all good and fine. But it, as a caster, that's very frustrating because you have you only get the view of one guy unless you physically use one of those um, adapters to switch to other monitors and stuff. They, d they just need to implement. And, and I know they've been talking about it, and they say they're, they're going to be doing it one way or another before or after launch, but they have to get on the ball, and day one, and, and I am saying day one, uh, some people disagree, day one is everything. First impressions are everything. Especially they with have, MMOs. Yes, and they have, if they want to have that foot in the door to say that we are going to try to be dare say as popular as the StarCraft esports scene. They need a, first off, they need a dedicated sponsors that are already before the game even launches putting out the promotions for tournaments. We're talking privatized and if they want to, public tournaments. They need B, a spectator mode that is actually working. They need a streaming service that is actually working. They need on demand at any given time ways to display the games and cast the games. They do not have that right now. What we saw at Gamescom and uh, and PAX, that's fine and dandy, but that's not esports. What we saw that was a a mockery of of what a spectator mode and what casting should be. Number one, um, and and I am being you know devil's advocate advocate here, but um, the casting in in some of those it was an arena net, but the people that were doing the casting it was horrible. They didn't know anything about the game, and, and when they were talking about it, it was just kind of like, uh, uh it, it, they were just talking about what they saw. They didn't know about what the skills were doing and, and any of that. If they, if they want to make a strong impression, they need to get some solid, concrete casters in support of the game. Secondly, they need to get a spectator mode where that caster, such as DJ Wheat, love you, man, um, can can actually get his grasp on the hand and, you know, on the game and while it's playing and get into it and get excited and if you guys have ever watched uh, everybody listening and, and viewing the stream if you've ever watched a StarCraft II game you know what I'm talking about um, there are certain casters um, that just draw you in you just love watching them because of their personality Guild Wars 2 doesn't have anybody supporting it like that yet because all of the major casters out there that everybody loves um, does not see the tools available to them yet. And that very well may change, but they also have mentioned specifically in the forum that it may happen after launch. And this is where I've chimed in because if it happens after launch, consider it dead. Esports will not happen. You will have people that um, that play it and enjoy it and, and you know play it competitively, but esports, as far as on a national level people that don't play guild wars 2 watching the game fans pro players will not happen if it's not in there from day one and I, that's my rant <laughs> i i kind of i'm gonna i disagree i i think it, it definitely it needs the tools it needs the proper spectating tools because that's the whole point of watching something you want to be able to watch everything that's going on and be entertained by it so they need to have some sort of, I don't know, like a, like a free, free flying camera so that they could get a sort of like aerial shot of the battles going on. They need something along those lines. But to say that if it's not there on day one, that it's completely dead, I, I, I just disagree with it in that if, if it is after launch, it can't be a year after launch. It has to be fairly close to the first day that it happens. I'll tell you what, though, if it, if it doesn't come out, 
on the launch, it's not going to come out for at least a month or two. Because with this kind of a game, um, <clears throat> there's usually a massive push. At least this is the usual development cycle. And I don't know if ArenaNet does it differently, but I'm going to assume they don't. Is that right before the launch, there's a massive push where everybody's working a lot of hours. And then they give like the whole team two or three weeks off because they've been working ridiculous hours for the past month and a half working right up to launch. That's how it used to be, and I could be wrong on that. I'm, uh, well, that I don't know if that's well, changed since what I remember. What, what I'm saying is that, that they need to have the spectating tools, but I think everyone needs to realize that they're not going to be perfect on day one. I mean, even when StarCraft came out, the spectating tools, they've grown and been updated and been improved over time. As long as they have something to have spectating on, the, on day one, yeah, it may not be perfect. And if it gives enough to let people actually commentate on what's going on and allow spectators to enjoy it, I think that's enough until they can, you know, get feedback and perfect the system. I just we'll think it's to... Go ahead. Oh, we'll agree to disagree. I'll finish your sentence. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to say that. <laughs> we'll agree to disagree because I, I think it needs to be in beta. Like, I, I kid you not. It, it needs to be ready and available. If not, it's not going to be perfect. You can't expect that. That's silly. But it needs to be available in beta. Like, they need to confirm that we will have this running sometime during beta so that casters can jump in on it and say, you know what, I can, make, I can continue my career. Because we're talking about playing a game. For them, this is money, money, cash money. And it's advertising, it's, it's publicity, it's, it's eSports. That's what it is. And um, it has to be, they have to have an incentive to jump in on that. It needs to be ready for beta. We'll, we'll disagree there. Another thing is, uh, that I didn't mention is replays. Um, yes, yes, ooh. yes. <laughs> it, it, replays have got, I mean, all right. Even at the, we'll call this second. We'll call this the second place. Okay, if we can't have first place prize to say that casting will be readily available with spectator tools, there has to be replay uh, ability. You have to. In this day and age, there should be no reason that at the end of a match I can't click save replay on the end. Um, everybody's used to that because of um, well, Blizzard wasn't the first one to do it, but it's well known that most casting is done on replays. That had, at least, I mean, can we agree on that, Jay? <laughs> that replays have no, to no, be in no. there? Tales of Heroes no, no, is definitely... built on replays because they had no spectator mode for Company of Heroes. Have we heard anything Lord, about replays really. at, at all? I don't, not that I know of at all. I know that they've talked I... about the spectator mode, but I haven't heard anything about replays. But let's, let's point out that I know for a fact that Guild Wars 1 had a spectator mode. And you could fly around and, and you could view. I remember specifically looking for this at one point um, when I was playing it. And I don't remember if it was when I first started playing it or when I came back later. I got the impression that it's when I came back later um, where you just click on this thing and it shows you a list of the live matches right now that you can watch. And it would say Guild X versus Guild Y or what have you. And so you could then watch those. Okay. Now, I'm one of the saying. things that tells me that they are specifically – really worried about this and actually paying attention and trying to deal with the spectator issues is uh, there was a particular in interview with Izzy, I think it was, in which I listened to him describe how he is a balance manager, uh, balance, balance, ba lead balance guy, te balancer on the, uh, the Guild Wars 1. And he would be sitting at his desk working on something and over on a different monitor he'd have a Guild versus Guild match for Guild Wars 1 going on the monitor. And he'd just be kind of glancing over at it every once in a while while he was working on a proposal or something like that. And then somebody would walk over and they'd stare at the monitor for like two minutes. And he'd glance over at it and go, oh, that team's about to go down in ten seconds. And they're like, how do you know that? I've been staring at this for two minutes. I have no idea what's going on. And sure, clockwork. Five, four, three, two. There goes the healer. There goes the lead tank. There goes the ranger. So he, because he was so ridiculously ingrained in all of the skills as the balance manager, um, he could easily see whatever was going on. Normal people could not because every skill had a different icon and every icon meant a different thing. Now, what they've specifically mentioned is there's only going to be a certain number of conditions that can be on you at any one time, and they have a specific color. When you're, when you're uh, crippled, you'll see your character limp visually. Somebody can look at that and go, oh, that character clearly is moving slower because he's limping, and, he's, and I can see that visually. It's easy to understand what's going on there. So the fact that they've really tried to streamline this interface and make it easier for spectators to understand the matches is going to make Guild Wars 2 a significantly bigger spectator sport, I think, than Guild Wars 1 ever was. Um, 
but I think I agree with Freelancer. I think those that the, the, the tools do need to be there, even in some form, on day one, just so that you can get started and you can get people excited. Because if they're not, people aren't going to take it seriously and they're not going to go back and try it. It needs that big push and the exponential bell curve of everybody going, oh, this is awesome, i got to get in on this, and have the growth start immediately. Because otherwise, you're going to have sort of this slow climb and it's not going to pick up until too late. It's going to be too late. Well, I, I, League of for, Legends is starting to pick up, though, and they didn't have anything on release. It's free to play, and it can play on anything. I don't no, know. I mean, that's no, a good point. I just don't know what to think. I'm, I'm going to go hide in a corner at... I'm going to go hide in the corner after I say this because I will be uh, burned at the stake. But League of Legends is, uh, when it first came out, nobody ever thought it was going to be anything serious. Um, it was a free-to-play game. Um, I'm choosing my words carefully here. <laughs> um, <I think> so. <laughs> it, 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 let's just put it like this. It, they never expected it to be as big as it, as it is now. It's a great game now, but they never thought it would, probably, it would get to that level. Um, so now that they are getting to that level, you know, they can afford to put in the research and development for making it an eSport. I still don't think it'll ever... Well, that's another subject. <laughs> so we do have people in the chat room here. Think about the trend. We go hide now. Somebody in the chat room the here said they, they said they are working on all their spectator and replays and such, that they might not come out before launch, but that they will do their best to bring it in before launch. I mean, what that says to me is, is they're just putting the... They're, they're just saying ahead of time... We really want all these things in the game before the launch, but we have to put a priority on the things. And I'm assuming their main priority is it can't crash on people's computers, the servers can't lag, the, the netcode has to be solid, and you know everything has to work as a player would expect it to first. Because if you have no people playing the game because the gameplay sucks, because it's laggy, because it's broken, because the graphics are screwed up, because they don't work on some computers, if those things don't work, then you don't have anything for people to spectate, right? So it sounds to me they're just hedging their bets and saying, listen, these are all the things we want to get in, but it's simply one step backwards on the priority list because if you don't have a solid game with solid netcode, with solid everything, then it doesn't matter who's spectating because there's nobody playing. At least I hope that's what they're saying. I, I, well, the from way a business I kinda... perspective, uh, oh, it doesn't need to come out on launch. It needs to come out with a marketing push. Yes. With the launch is definitely going to be the most buzz, but think about it. If it's around and it does well on launch and you put those features in eventually like a few months in and then when the expansion comes out, you put a big marketing push behind it. Oh, we've advanced it even further and perfected the replay system and the spectator system. I think that could blow it up just as much. It doesn't necessarily have to be at launch, but it does need to be with a big marketing push and with a lot of buzz behind it. All right. I, 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 I kind of final final comments because I want to move on to uh, to talking a little bit about the Battle of Colo before we have to shut it down here. So go ahead, Jay. Finish I your just, thought. I, the thing I kind of look at it is that so whenever the game comes out and it's released, there's going to be a learning period for everyone. So like day one comes out, there's not a there's you know there's not going to be a big cash tournament the week after that. I I feel like there has to be some sort of grace period where people are learning the game and messing around with it before it could jump into the esports. I just This is I don't, I'm not I'm not that much I you know I don't know that much about esports but just throwing in my two cents. All right. So, uh let's move on here cuz I think we've beaten this horse to death. Uh <laughs> let's talk about the battle of Colo. That is the one that was revealed at PAX and the one that was uh, was revealed at Gamescom, and they, they showed off that map as far as a competitive PvP mode. Um, and basically what you have there is three capture points. One of them is in a clock tower, one sort of in a field, and one's in front of a mansion, and a little village in the middle. And then on each side, each team has a trebuchet, which they can fire. Uh, when you get on it, it changes your weapon set to be three weapons, either turn left, turn right, or hold this thing for a certain amount of time to fire. And it's sort of a, you know, you hold it for 50% of the time and it fires at half strength and it goes a certain distance. So you kind of have to time it. You have to know, okay, I have to hold this for two seconds if I want to fire directly into the, um, the clock tower, for example. Now, what's really cool that they've demonstrated on this map is all the destroyable terrain. Everything starts out intact, and when you use the trebuchets, and I assume other things can damage it too, but the trebuchet specifically will actually like knock down walls of the clock tower. So instead of fighting in an enclosed space, now you're fighting on like this open rooftop almost, and the trebuchet can be raining down on top of you. So that's a really cool feature of what that engine is capable of. I thought that was awesome. 
I think the trebuchet is just a gimmick. I really don't like it. I I think it's kind of just like it's going to throw off the whole dynamic of that that sort of uh, capture point thing. And I think the way it is now, they could change it, of course, but I think the way it is now, it's just like it feels too. Eh, eh, that's even yeah. a word. Virtual high five to Luke for saying that. Um, <laughs> it, it, I'm just going to agree on that. I'm not even going to go into it. I'll go into another rant. I think Clock Tower, the whole idea of that, that general PvP scenario is as, is as bland as it gets. Um, it's a tower in the middle of a maze uh, you know, of walls that destroy and can be broken apart. Not even the walls, actually. It's just the tower. Um it, it it needs a lot of work. A trebuchet is is what we call RNG, and uh, and it's you, it, they're trying to put it out there as something that serious teams will put will revolve you know strategies entirely around who who is on the trebuchet and stuff. But I think a lot of teams are just going to blow it off as as gimmicky and not really worth even paying attention to because it's so random. Um, and even when it's um, when it's used correctly. You can never really be sure that it's... Imagine yourself as a character. I, I know that I would be more useful out in the field than shooting a, blo- a trebuchet that hits one out of ten times, if that. Uh, it's, that's just the way I feel about it. I, I, I'm on the fence about the trebuchet being gimmicky, um, but in terms of the walls and the environment being destructible... For me, that, that's the reason why I like Battlefield so much more than Call of Duty. is because when you have the destructible environment, it adds another factor to it. And, you know, it's a little bit different in an MMO as opposed to an FPS because now if a camper's behind a wall, you could blow up the wall and they're no longer a camper. But I just think that having the destructible environment is cool and I think it could add a good amount of depth to the PvP. I uh, completely agree with you on that. I mean... You know, I think I think the uh, the mansion was one of the uh, capture points, and just being able to literally j- literally jump through the windows and surprise your opponents is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I, I'm completely there with you on the uh, destructible environment. Yeah, it has a lot to. I, I kind of feel like you guys are right about the gimmicky nature of it. I felt like it didn't look super useful, but here's. Here's one thing. I, I know that ArenaNet mentioned that for a long time when they were really ge- gearing up before this convention season, they said they would, play, um, they would play matches, PvP matches. The dev team would just, you know, had, have two separate teams or maybe they'd mix up, I don't know exactly, but they'd play every day. Every day they'd play some PvP. And that's how they got the team that wound up playing at PAX and things like that. That was, that was one of the results. That's why they won everything because they obviously were playing it. So it's good to see for number one, I'd like to say it's awesome really great to see that a team that is building a game is playing their own game because that's not always the case if you've played a lot of crappy games. Anyway, um, that said, there was a place where somebody put up their builds and they apparently felt that through all that testing and all that time that the trebuchet was useful because they had certain builds that utilized the trebuchet and certain builds that didn't. So... I don't know. It, it didn't look like it would be... A, like, I'm, I'm feeling the same way that you are, Freelancer. Like, I would be more effective as a player out there dealing the damage and, and, and using crowd control and using all of my different things that I can do than sitting back here and, you know, even if it does the 9,000 damage or whatever it was, even if it does that damage, can, is that really much more effective than if I was out there as a player? Uh, I'll, I'll put it very simply for you, and I'll write on that, Bridger. Um Would you rather, you controlling your five-man team, let's... Um, Let's say that all of us here in this this chat right now is a five man team, and you were running it, Bridger. Um, would you not rather an extra guy next to you taking multiple points that you have total control over, and you, you're able to assess the situation? Your guy's right there, providing you with all sorts of different kinds of support, depending on what class they are, or a guy, one of your teammates, at twenty percent of your team, mm-hmm. off in the middle of nowhere by himself. Because you wouldn't dare put somebody to defend them. That's even worse. Right. Uh, off by its, off by itself, randomly contribute, randomly contributing, if at all, throughout the entire match. Well, so what that's, do you think? So that's the thing. Well, hang on, I, I got to say this because it seems to me like it just occurred to me that the advantage of somebody being on the trebuchet is that from that position they can assist everybody else on their team, not just one guy. 
so that maybe they won't be able to assist any single person as well as if they were right with them, but they can assist any one person that comes under heavy attack. Because it's a ba massive AoE damage. So if the, opponent, if the opposing team is using a strategy where they zerg with two or three people onto a, an area to try and outnumber you, dropping trebuchet shots onto those two or three people simultaneously seems like that would be a really good thing. But if they're using a very spread out strategy, maybe the trebuchet is less effective. And so the idea is either arena net sort of found it to be effective even though real players wouldn't, real PV, you know, real, real competitive players, I should say, people that would, you know, that are hardcore, they do this all the time, rah, rah, rah. Uh, or, <laughs> so either they're wrong and real competitive <laughs> players will not find it effective, or maybe they know more than we do because they've been able to play the game. We're all just speculating. I, and you're also under the assumption um, that the trebuchet actually hits its target. Go ahead, Jay. I saw it hit sometimes. <laughs> they, I, think, I think you need to think a little bit broader because in Guild Wars 1... I specifically remember a couple of PvP matches I played where, um, what was the mode? I guess it was capture the flag or some sort of deathmatch kind of thing. And, you know, literally someone drew the entire team into a certain area that someone was aiming the trebuchet at. You launch a trebuchet in there, you take out the whole team, and now you just stomp all over them. I mean, if you think about it outside of the capture points, because, yes, if you have someone that's manning the trebuchet, that's... That's one less person you have running around defending points and taking points. In that sense, it's sort of like a double-edged sword. Like, yes, you could use it offensively and defensively to help take points. Um, but in another situation where maybe it's just deathmatch or maybe it's just flag capture, then it might have a little more use to it as opposed to point defense and attacking. And this is only one map, we should point out. This is one map with one thing, and they tried to say that every map is going to have its thing, like the trebuchet is unique to this battle, and other maps are going to have other shticks. Maybe there's going to be portals that allow you to move from place to place, or some other thing. I, that, that's not an example that they have given, that's just one of the things that came up off my head. And, and you know what's great about this? We're talking strategy about it. Um, if at the very least, just the the fact that we're talking about whether the, the, the usefulness of the trebuchet is worth it for that 20% of my team it is great right there. I mean, that speaks for itself, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, All right, let's wrap uh, up with the final thoughts because we're at the hour mark here. Anybody have any final thoughts? I'll just say this is that I think it was Jeff Kaplan at GDC one year, sort of like the lessons they learned from WoW. And one of the things he said was don't force gimmicky things on players. And I'm just going to end with that. I agree. I, uh, and the trebuchet is not forced on you. It's there. And if people find it effective, it'll get used. If it's not effective, the map certainly seems perfectly serviceable without it. I don't know. I feel like the trebuchet... I, I'm kind of on the fence. I mean, considering that uh, I, I think Team Arena Net actually wrote a, a, a brief article about um, their team composition and you know all of that, and they said that the ranger um, was literally... His job was to stay on the trebuchet and protect it as well as use it. And... Um, I, I don't know. Sometimes I felt like he, he could have been more of a more of a, a better contribution to the team if he was there attacking or taking points. But I can also see the fact that if you are pretty skilled, as someone said in chat, if you are pretty skilled with the trebuchet, you can literally you know knock out a whole team or knock out a point and have your team literally just rush in there, you know, Rainbow Six style and just take the you know take the point. But um, I, I don't know. I'm just on the fence. So we'll, we'll just have to see. That's the yeah, answer to pretty much every show. The show ends with. <laughs> and we'll have to see how that comes out. <laughs> oh, the challenges of dealing with a game that's not released yet. So, I guess uh, that's about time to wrap it up here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for sticking with us. And I know we're trying to make the show a little shorter, so we got it to the hour mark today. Congratulations, everybody. Yeah. We did one topic to an hour instead of three <laughs> topics to an hour and 20 minutes. So I think we actually, we actually kind of did worse, didn't we? We, we, we did we, oh, what? we spread up one topic even longer than we needed to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Potatoes, so, potatoes. Exactly. It's a broad topic, though. It's very broad. Broad topic. PvP is huge. That's right. So we'll, uh, we'll try this again next week. Again, if you want to want to participate in the chat and talk with us while we're, while we're and give us feedback and tell us why this we're wrong, uh, go to uh, <laughs> talesoftyria.com. Next week, Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time is going to be the... Uh, the time that we get started. And now that we've got it all figured out, we'll actually start at 8 o'clock, I promise. So uh, for everybody here, I am Bridger signing off. Have a good one, guys. See ya. See you later, Catch guys. See you later. Adios.